welcome to the HubSpot Admin Hug. Today's hug is Steal This Workflow Foundational Strategy with Stuart Balcom, Head of Growth at Arrows. Um, this workshop will provide a deep dive into the foundational principles of the automated workflows in the Steal This Workflow series and walk through common examples of how to leverage workflows in your day-to-day -day work. So Stuart, I'm going to let you go ahead and take it off and I appreciate you being here. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Thank you uh, to everybody who's joining. Wow, 127 people here. That's awesome. Uh, so yeah, as uh, Dan mentioned, uh, I can dive into some of the sort of principles in, in the Stills Workflow series. Uh, I have some, some workflows that you may or may not have seen, but I want to sort of talk through uh, why they are the way that they are um, and sort of get into how you can apply the, you know, the very specific the examples and maybe very specific, but how you can apply uh, the sort of components of those workflows to you know, things that you're trying to solve yourself in your own account, in your own portal. Um, but I'm going to go ahead and share my screen really quickly here. Uh, I promise I will not stay in the deck very long. Um, we'll get into HubSpot and the workflows. But uh, really quickly, um, so I mentioned uh, I'm head of growth at Arrows. Um, and primarily, the, the thing that I've been focused on when it comes to HubSpot, and sort of Arrows is focused there too is use cases for onboarding and customer success. So really sort of post-sale uh, things in HubSpot, which have been really interesting because they are uh, you know, less common, uh, less, uh, less well-served from a sort of education and, and product perspective in HubSpot, which has been a, uh, a really interesting challenge or sort of opportunity to go figure out some creative solutions uh, to those things. Uh, I've certainly learned a lot along the way and hopefully you can share some of that uh, with you all today as well. Uh, so what I'm gonna get into, I have some principles um, for, for workflows and then from there, we'll just get right into HubSpot uh, and look at these sort of three big buckets of, of things, uh, scoring and trends, uh, handoffs, and how that relates to using pipelines for different lifecycle stages, and then thresholds and engagement um, and how that impacts sort of the way that you might think about enrollment triggers for workflows. Uh, as Hannah mentioned, uh, one benefit of being here, um, there's a whole bunch of stuff that you can uh, go and grab at the end. Uh, if you head over to arrows.to slash bolt, um, there's a little sign up form there. Um, if you put your email in there, we'll send you all this uh, great stuff. Um, the, the workflows themselves, some step-by-step -step walkthroughs, and uh, this really comfy, happy customers t-shirt. Um, so, if you head over to arrows.to slash bolt, you can go grab uh, all that stuff, but let's get into it. So uh, the first thing actually, uh, before I start talking a little bit more uh, is I'd love to hear from you all. Um, specifically, this is an area that I've been focused on, but we'd love to hear um, from you all in the chat. Um, what is sort of the biggest challenge that you run into or that you hear um, customers of yours running into or clients of yours running into when it comes to things that are post-sale in HubSpot. So that might be onboarding, that might be customer success, customer support, but which sort of bucket do, do those challenges typically fall into? Um, I'd love to hear um, and sort of get a, get a pulse on, you know, what is uh, most interesting uh, or most helpful to, uh, to hear about when it comes to solving that and, and improving the way that you do things uh, post-sale. So uh, let's actually get started. So the first thing that I want to uh, talk about is sort of principles of effective workflows. Uh, there are these are things that I've uh, sort of found to be true, found to be sort of recurring patterns uh, as I've been building workflows in HubSpot. Um, and I think the thing that's become really interesting to me um, as I've done, as I've built more and more workflows and sort of explored different use cases that are maybe uh, have unconventional solutions in HubSpot. The thing that I found interesting is there's, there's actually a few patterns that repeat um, and that once you figure out uh, something that works for one problem, you can then go and apply that to a different problem. But the principles that I would typically start with for any new workflow that I'm, that I'm working on or any new problem that I'm trying to solve with a workflow is first figure out what is the data that you know? What is the data that you both have available in HubSpot already uh, that is going to be consistently available and consistently updated, right? If you're going to build an automated workflow or an automated system, uh, it's going to be built on top of data. And if that data isn't consistent, isn't always available, 
you're going to run into issues with uh, your workflow not triggering, the, the workflow triggering when you don't expect it to or don't want it to trigger, um, or running with data that isn't consistent with uh, what you expect and ultimately isn't going to drive the outcome that you want. So that's sort of number one. Uh, number two, and this is something that uh, we'll get into when I show some actual workflows. This is something that I use all the time in HubSpot, uh, but is using the trigger of a workflow um, as sort of a, you know, triggering a workflow when a threshold is met in the data. So an example of that might be something as simple as, uh, you know, uh, last contacted more than two days ago, for example. Um, and that becomes a really easy way to sort of surface things uh, automatically because you can set a workflow against it, uh, surface things automatically that would take a lot of manual work to go and identify. Uh, let's say it's the workflow is I want to contact or I want to personally reach out to all deals uh, that haven't been engaged in the last two days, just for as an example. That would probably take a lot of time if you were to go and do that manually, right? You'd have to uh, go to your pipeline. You'd have to click into each and every deal, uh, look at the timeline of activity and see how recently uh, they had been contacted. I mean, sure, you could show it uh, on the, uh, the pipeline cards themselves. But having a workflow means that you can sort of proactively surface that information. So data thresholds are a really great way to save yourself and your team a whole lot of time uh, in a workflow. Um, number three, this one is probably often the most often overlooked, um, but something that I think is, is particularly important if you're running workflows uh, sort of at scale or you have a workflow that is going to get triggered, um, you have re-enrollment turned on and it's going to get triggered uh, a lot, uh, but making sure that you're catching and uh, escalating exceptions. So an example would be if you, you know, expect to have uh, a certain piece of data because you want to include that in the task that you'll create in the workflow. If that data isn't available on the, the record that you're running the, the workflow on, you want to make sure that you're surfacing that so that you can say, okay, this is a problem that maybe it's only happening once in a while and there's a, a one-off fix, or maybe it's something a little more systemic and you need to go back and revisit your workflow or revisit your, your process. Um, to fix that for the future. But the worst, th the worst thing that can happen is you have uh, workflows that fail silently and everybody's expecting them to work. They're not working and you don't realize that it's because there's a problem with the workflow uh, rather than just that the trigger isn't, um, you know, the trigger isn't happening or the trigger event isn't happening. Um, fourth, and this one uh, I mentioned sort of in passing earlier, but Often there are reusable components in workflows. So there might be specific little blocks of a workflow that you can take that pattern and go and use it somewhere else in a different workflow or solve a different problem. Um, and I think learning to identify uh, what are those, those patterns uh, makes it much more efficient when you go to build a new workflow or when you go to solve a, uh, a new problem with, uh, with a workflow um, because you sort of already have that in your back pocket. You're not starting from from scratch every time. And then finally, uh, acknowledging that workflows aren't just sort of a set and forget it uh, type thing as much as automation is great and will save you a, a ton of time. Uh, knowing that the business is changing, the data that's coming in is potentially changing, the way that the team wants to interact with uh, the sort of outcome of a workflow uh, potentially changes. Um, and sort of setting a cadence for yourself or setting a uh, even if it's just a, a reminder, go, we, we set this workflow live on you know, the 1st of April. Uh, let's set a reminder to check in on, on the 1st of May and, and see how things are going. Make sure that the, the users and the, the adoption of, of what's happening in that workflow is as you expect. So with that said, let's get into uh, HubSpot. Let's get into some workflows. So, and by the way, if at any point, if you have, have questions, if you, you want to me to go deeper on something, just let us, let me know in the, uh, in the chat. Um, hopefully there'll, there'll be plenty of time for questions at the end as well, but um, let's get into this first topic uh, and putting the, put this first because it's of all the things that I have uh, shared, this is the one that uh, has got the most attention, I think, probably because it's uh, health scoring or health, uh, customer health is a, uh, a big, big topic uh, that 
uh, I guess is not immediately obvious that you can you can address in HubSpot. So I'm just going to walk through this uh, particular workflow. The the one thing that I will uh, caveat this with is that this workflow actually starts after you've already calculated the health score, <laughs> um, which health scoring uh, is so is going to be so business dependent. So uh, it's such a uh, such a big topic. Um, you could we could run a whole other uh, a whole other workshop just on on how you get to a health score. Um, but a health score might be made up of uh, of activity, it could be made up of satisfaction, it could be made up with product data, it can be made up with any number of things. Uh, but in this case, our starting point uh, is we have a property, uh, this calculated health score, and we're going to trigger this workflow when it is known. Um, we're going to also turn re-enrollment on. And this is, this is one of those uh, little patterns that I find myself using all the time that essentially allows you to run this workflow. And I know, um, uh, I don't want to muddy this, but if you, uh, if you are in the workflow triggers beta, uh, this might look a little bit different for you. Um, but this is a great, uh, a great little pattern for triggering a workflow anytime a property value changes is to use, uh, you know, property value is known and then turn re-enrollment on. Make sure you check both boxes here. And anytime that property value updates, uh, this workflow will will run again. So we're saying anytime that our health score is known, we want to run this workflow. And then the first part of this is uh, kind of aesthetic, I guess, but is uh, can be really helpful for reporting. Um, we're essentially taking this calculated health score and grouping uh, the the scores. So in this case, we're out of ten, um, or scores up to ten. Um, and we're grouping in the scores into ranges so that we can more easily categorize them um, as you'll see down here, each of the branches is either green if it's healthy, yellow if it's neutral, or uh, red if it's at risk. Um, and what that allows us to do is more easily report on uh, where a specific account is, right? You both have the advantage of, you don't have to have the end user understand what does this number actually mean? You can just show them okay, this is uh, green, yellow, or red. Um, and it also means for reporting, you're rolling those values up, right? Um, so you can say, you know, 30% is healthy, 20% is uh, is neutral, and 50% is unhealthy. Hopefully uh, those numbers are all flipped, but um, this is one thing that is incredibly helpful is taking a numeric score using an if-then branch to group those scores uh, and if I just open this up here with nothing more complicated than, you know, greater than or equal to this middle one will always need to include both ends of the range. Um, and then the bottom one will just be the, the bottom of the range. Um, but the nothing more complicated than saying, okay, if the score is in this range, then assign it, assign a different property. So you see calculated health score and then health, uh, assign it an emoji um, which is a little bit of a hack uh, for giving you some sort of visual aid for, for what that score is. The other thing that um, I mentioned, I'm breaking my own rule here, um, but you'll notice here that we have none met uh, as a criteria or as a, a branch in our um, workflow. Um, I would always include this. Um, and the way that I would escalate this is if you create a task um, and assign it to, you know, maybe you have a specific person that you want to, maybe it's you as the admin that you want to assign uh, exceptions to, but you can create a task here that's, you know, uh, data out of range for uh, health score. Um, and I can go ahead. Yep. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. I there was a question, is health score the same as lead score? Uh, no, typically the way I would think about it is no, um, although it would work pretty much exactly the same. Um, essentially, you're just taking input about your, yeah, you're taking input uh, from data that you have about uh, a specific record that might be a contact. Uh, and health scoring generally will be at a company level or sort of an account level. Um, but 
essentially you're taking data that you have about uh, a record and then based on that data you're making some approximation of uh, to, to give it a score right in this case we're calling that score health you could also call it lead score um, the way the which is sort of why uh, I started this workflow um, after that point <laughs> right so uh, this workflow will work if you were to replace this with calculated lead score um, you know this could be calculated satisfaction score this could be sort of any score that you uh, you want um, any any numeric value essentially that you're assigning to a record um, and from there you can run this workflow to categorize that score and then show the trend of that score as well um, but yeah good question um, I would say that health scoring is different than lead scoring, um, typically used in a different stage of the life cycle, but the workflow that you would use around it um, would be very much the same or could use around it would be very much the same. Um, anyway, so, so yeah, so this is a good example of, we have the branch that's catching an exception. I've created a task here and assign it to whoever's gonna be responsible for looking into um, and resolving that exception, making sure that it's not a sort of more systemic issue with the with the workflow. Um, okay, so we got through uh, assigning a rating to a range uh, of our scores. And the next thing here is, which I think is interesting, and this took me a long time to figure out. Um, the one thing that HubSpot is not very good at uh, is allowing you to see historical values of properties. Um, it's kind of challenging to figure out, you know, directionally, um, where is a score going? If you have a score, um, just because it's changing, that, that change could be good, that change could be bad, right? Going from uh, negative to neutral is much better than, uh, or is a, you know, is positive. Um, and going from positive to neutral is, is maybe not great. And you would want to know that beyond just reporting on uh, what is the current score of, uh, this. Um, yes, so absolutely share the, the health score example after the, the session. But uh, just to show how sort of do this trend piece, which admittedly is, is imperfect and a little limited, but it will give you at least a directional indication of the last change of a property. Um, unfortunately, full property history is, is still difficult. Um, I would love to, if anybody has a great solution for that, I would love to know um, what that is. Um, but the way that we're doing this is we are using another property. So you'll notice we have three properties now. We have calculated health score, which is the sort of original input uh, numeric score. We have health, which is a, uh, it's a drop-down select in this case with the, the emoji rating. Um, and then we have a third property for trend. Uh, and trend, if I jump over uh, and share this tab, Trend is a calculated property uh, where we are just taking our calculated health score, which is again, the input property to uh, this workflow. And then we have another property called previous health score, which is just another numeric uh, property. And we're doing uh, essentially current minus previous um, to give us this trend value. And what that allows us to do is in a, another if then branch, I can say, if trend is greater than zero, we're trending up. If trend is less than zero, we're trending down. And if there's no change, then you know, there's no change. <laughs> um, if the, the two values are equal, then there's no change. And then uh, in the, the next stage here, we're saying, okay, if it's trending up, then we have this health score trend property, which is again, another, you know, it's the, <laughs> Lots of if then branches and emojis here. Um, if it's trending up, we're gonna assign uh, the sort of up and to the right emoji to the health score trend property, trending down, down and to the right, or no change. HubSpot formats that this emoji support must not be great. Um, <laughs> but you know, there's a, a no change emoji here too. And then all we're doing uh, once we have that property set uh, is we are, and this is sort of the, this is the piece that really took me a long time to figure out is we're assigning the uh, calculated uh, health score, which we entered this workflow with to the company property previous health score. So that's the one that's used in that trend K 
calculations. We're essentially saying once we've done everything that we need to in terms of assigning a rating and setting a trend uh, with the current value of the calculated health score property, we're going to make that the previous health score value so that the next time this workflow runs, we can do that calculation again. We can reset the, the trend value if anything has changed because calculated health score will then be a new value and the previous health score value will be the, the score that this workflow ran with or this time through the workflow ran with. Um, and then finally, this will be this is pretty common in uh, workflows that I've set up is send some kind of notification, surface what happened in this workflow uh, more broadly to, to teams. Um, you know, if there's a, a change in health score, it went from previous to current, um, it's, and it's now you know, this property value or this, uh, this health score rating. Um, and by setting this, you can start to it sort of gets into the proactively identify uh, accounts that might need attention, um, accounts that maybe have met some threshold in, uh, in the data, and then ultimately make it easier for the people on the team to go and do the things that only they can do, which you can't automate, um, and which they're going to be most high leverage to help support a customer and you know, move them through, through the journey. Um, so I'm going to pause, uh, pause there. Any questions on, on this workflow, on the, the sort of the concepts in here, which is the sort of two big concepts in here, uh, is taking a numeric score and assigning it a, a rating, um, which is helpful for reporting, um, and then also calculating a trend uh, based on that numeric value. Lots of positive comments on the niceness of the uh, setup itself, the brilliance of the setup. So, <laughs> thanks everyone. Um, the I will say that the the one thing that uh, didn't the calculator score need to be cleared in order for it to run the workflow. Um, if it changes, the the workflow will rerun. Um, so. Yeah, you you don't need to to clear it, but uh, as soon as once it is updated, uh, the workflow will will rerun. Um, yeah, great note, Gemma, on the number of custom calculator properties. Uh, five that for especially for customer success use cases, uh, five becomes pretty limited. <laughs> um, I find find myself. Uh, Uh, I have not found that to be a problem, uh, Christoph, the, the one and two minute delay. Um, uh, I think particularly with this workflow, if you, the, the times that I have found that to be a problem, if you, when you need delays is if you are using services that are external to HubSpot, um, typically if it's property values in HubSpot updating, um, then it's okay. Um, I know that if you're using a service that's you know calling an external API, then uh, including delays, especially if that we we've run into this uh, or found uh, found challenges with this at Arrows is depending on how whether a workflow is running uh, asynchronously or synchronously, it doesn't always wait for that data to come back that you maybe are going to use in a uh, a later step. So in that case, the the delay might be helpful. Um, Jennifer, yes, health score in this case is a custom calculated property. Um, that could be as simple as, um, you know, satisfaction, well, the whole kind of worms, but uh, that could be as simple as uh, satisfaction scores from, you know, HubSpot satisfaction surveys. If you're uh, running that on uh, the contact level, there's some things you can do if you want that uh, score at the, the company level. Um, but yes, uh, in any case, it, it would be a, a custom property um, and you sort of have the flexibility to um, uh, to set that however you, or calculate that however you would want. Uh, rerun workflow recording the previous health score. That put in the workflow. Uh, I, again, haven't run into to that, Reese. Um, 
I think, I mean, you, the property value isn't being changed throughout the workflow. So the only, I mean, the, there are always exceptions or probably always cases where you could go and break this. Typically the, the property value for health score is not going to be updated uh, super frequently. Um, so as long as it's not being up, if, if it's being updated while the workflow is running, then you certainly see problems there. Um, but generally that's, that's not going to be the case. Um, okay. Let's move on to, to workflow number two, um, which is a little, a little simpler, um, but probably uh, a more common or a, a very common use case for, uh, for folks. Um, okay. So this workflow um, is for handing off closed one deals, uh, presumably in your, your sales pipeline, um, to sort of subsequent stages of the customer journey. So that could be uh, onboarding, that could be renewals, um, whatever comes next uh, in your specific process. So uh, the first thing that we're going to do here is enroll deals in this workflow when they are closed one in the pipeline that we want to look at. Uh, I'm including a check here. This is probably overkill if you're using required properties in your, your pipelines. Um, but I'm including a check here for any data that we're going to need later in this workflow. Again, I would absolutely make all of these properties uh, required in your pipelines, um, but having them uh, checking that they are known in the workflow also means that we can, uh, you know, fire uh, any escalations, create any tasks. I'll probably delete this one uh, here. We might not want to set that back, but. Um, you know, create a task that is missing information, assign it to the deal owner, assign it to the um, the, the rev ops or ops uh, person who's who's implementing this workflow. Um, and then beyond that, the couple of things that we're going to do here are create new records for those subsequent lifecycle stages. That's one thing that I would uh, would always suggest doing. Um, <laughs> I, I love that one. Um, uh, one thing that I would always uh, suggest doing is creating new pipelines or uh, separate pipelines for each stage of the customer lifecycle. Um, so in this case, we're going to create a new deal record for uh, for the renewal. We're sort of assume, making the assumption here that we have an annual renewal. Um, you would want to handle this differently, uh, probably in a branch if you uh, with separate branches um, if you have different. Uh, periods of renewal um, because you're going to want to be able to set the close date um, appropriately based on uh, you know the number of days to that renewal. Um, you'll notice here there's uh, one thing that we uh, are doing is we're setting the uh, the deal name to include uh, the year of uh, the next renewal so we can sort of differentiate these. Um, these deals in our renewal pipeline. Um, and then we're also setting a specific property for renewal year and copying over any critical information that we're going to need um, for that you know, subsequent stage in the life cycle. So typically the things being copied over here are going to be you know, to the point about sales, not necessarily uh, always filling in uh, what you need, like making sure that that experience is as easy as possible by only requiring things that you're actually going to use in the next stage um, can, of course, be helpful um, to increase adoption there. But uh, in this case, we have amount, we have success metrics, which, of course, is important for, for onboarding and success. Uh, persona here, we have a property, which is essentially um, a way to segment customers, right? Like you, the, you could also be breaking... Uh, down uh, if they bought a specific product, if they bought a custom implementation versus not, for example, uh, what are the things that you're going to use to sort of branch the uh, branch the workflow or branch the the experience for the customer in in later stages, um, and then of course copying over any activity that we have about uh, this deal. So that's uh, renewals. Um, we can certainly go deeper into renewals if we want a little conscious of, uh, of time here. The renewals uh, thing is interesting. I'll certainly share the uh, the setup for or the how-to setup for that uh, in more detail as well, because it, there are certainly some workarounds 
needed if you want to automate your renewal pipeline um, to get around uh, A, to include, uh, continue to include dynamic uh, you know, values in the, in the name for the, the renewal year, but also um, to, you quickly run into limitations with creating new deals in a workflow uh, for deals in the same pipeline. Um, so there's a workaround for that, um, which I'll share as well. But the other record that we're creating here is for onboarding. In this case, we're creating a ticket. Uh, folks who are only using Sales Hub and not uh, Service Hub could also be using a separate deal pipeline for this. Um, but this one is much easier. Um, we don't have any sort of, uh, we're not, we don't need to do as much math <laughs> uh, on, on onboarding this. Uh, so this is just uh, create a new uh, ticket using the original deal name in the onboarding pipeline. Uh, and it, as I mentioned, include things like, do they need a migration? Uh, who is the original sales owner of this deal can be helpful um, to have. Um, so this workflow relatively simple, um, but I find that how, this is a great one that pretty much every account is, uh, is going to be able to implement or that they'll have this, uh, this stage um, and the big advantage of putting the handoff in a workflow uh, is that it allows you to one, define the data uh, that is gonna be required in, in future, st future stages and, and make sure that you actually have it, um, but also help reduce the time uh, that sort of lag between, okay, we closed the deal over here, um, but then the next team didn't get everything they needed. They had to go sort of manually find the information they needed on the previous record. Um, and, and all that time is, is potentially slowing down uh, a customer making progress through the handoff and sort of get building momentum into, uh, into onboarding. Um, <laughs> um, which is of course, uh, you know, building momentum in onboarding is of course something we talk about a ton at, at Arrows, but uh, something that we see a lot uh, as well is, you know, if you have this pipeline for sales, you have this pipeline for onboarding, uh, it's pretty common that you see deals just get stuck or customers just get stuck uh, and start ghosting uh, because they don't know what to do next. They haven't had the appropriate contact, um, which often are things that could be uh, easily resolved by better defining what is A, when uh, a customer is ready to move from, from one pipeline to another, uh, but also making sure the, the data is available and accessible uh, at the right time. So. That's uh, handoffs. And then I mean, this last one, uh, which I think is has pretty broad application. It's, it's a relatively simple uh, workflow, but the, the principles I think are, are pretty broadly applicable. So let me share this one, um, which is, I think is, is really interesting and sort of really leans into that idea of setting, using thresholds in your data uh, as enrollment triggers for, for workflows. So this is the type, type of workflow that you might be running, uh, you know, if you're running a uh, sort of product-led or, or sales assist type motion in, uh, in HubSpot, where you have, uh, in this case, we have projects created. Um, and this might be uh, data that you're you know, integrating via, um, maybe you're using a, a reverse ETL or a, um, you know, another service to, to bring in data from your product or uh, from, uh, from another source about what's happening with customers. Um, but this can be a, be a good way to, to kick off a workflow. So if you have, uh, you know, project traders less than or equal to three, we want to go ahead and send them a, uh, send them a welcome email. So this might be for you know for new accounts. Um, they're in the early stages of a journey, haven't haven't gotten going yet. Um, send them an automated email, and then we can sort of branch um, branch the experience based on what we know about a specific account. So in this case, we are checking uh, the we're just using data that HubSpot is providing us with. You know the number of employees um, at a company is a, a property that the HubSpot will populate. Um, so if there's more than 100 employees in this example where um, we're setting that as the threshold for we want a human in the loop um, to, to help move them onto the next stage um, and then check that we don't currently have an open deal for them. Um, and then if that's the case, we can create a deal 
uh, rotate it to, this is a, a pattern that um, I use a lot because it saves you so many headaches later, which is uh, whenever you're creating a record, uh, don't assign it to somebody. Um, and then immediately follow that with rotating the record through a team. Even if you were working with um, a team of one, uh, I would always take this approach because it makes it much, much easier to manage uh, who is being assigned deals or tickets uh, or what a, whatever other record uh, later, if somebody leaves or if somebody new joins, um, it's much, much easier to add them to the, to the team than have to go back and remember every workflow where you have to go and change uh, the specific person that it's, it's being assigned to. Um, so it's the first thing, um, creating a deal, assigning it to a specific person and sending uh, a, a notification about that. Um, or if they're not meeting that sort of human in the loop uh, type, uh, type threshold that we're setting in this branch, then we can check you know, different data. I mean, say in this case, we have a delay. Um, if our app, you know, we're using a project created here, we're sort of assuming this is a project management app um, and that it's collaborative. So we, we want there to be team members. Um, and, and all these, of course, are just examples, but uh, these values or these properties um, will be very specific to, to your business. But the, the point that they are, uh, you know, we check, check one threshold up here, um, wait, and then check a different threshold to identify if there's upgrade potential. And again, all these thresholds are going to be very specific and should be sort of based on the data that you have about what actually equals upgrade potential. But, um, you know, in this case, if there are more than five team members that have been added, we're going to say, yes, they, they have upgrade potential and we will just put them in this uh, sales assist flow. Um, so they could, you know, have not met this criteria, right? They could be, maybe there are only 50 employees, but they have very quickly added five team members and we want to make sure that we're supporting that account to get them to the next stage. Um, or if they, they haven't uh, met that upgrade potential uh, threshold, then we can, uh, we can go ahead and wait. We can send them some educational content in, uh, in automated email. And this side of the branch could you know, go on as, as long as you want. Maybe uh, you actually want to include you only want to send them two days of educational content and then you want to check this again, right? Um, and you could just copy uh, copy this down here um, and you essentially have, um, you know, you could, this, this, uh, this workflow could flow on for uh, forever if you wanted to. You'd of course have to change these, these emails. Um, but the idea being that you can rely on the workflow to surface the accounts that uh, the need human intervention uh, or that you want to, to add uh, human intervention to. And for the accounts that don't meet that threshold, you can automate the, the experience that they have um, in a, a more sort of scalable way. So any questions on, uh, on this? Um, I know this is, uh, we just sort of went through three pretty different uh, examples, I would say. Um, but yeah, curious to hear any, any questions, if there's anything that anybody would like to see uh, more, more deeply um, covered. Um, I know sort of mentioned renewals in passing, but um, anything that anybody wants to see, um, more than happy to, to dive into. I'm just looking through the, the questions here in the chat too. Uh, show these workflows as templates that one can use and refine as needed. Uh, I don't believe I can do that. I would love to be able to do that. Um, but I believe that's a HubSpot thing. So if HubSpot wants to do that, then that's <laughs> more than okay. Um, we have, you know, video walkthroughs and like the the screenshots of of all of these that you can can steal. But as far as I know, making them templates that you can just sort of one click add to your account is a little more challenging. I think everybody was so intently watching you <laughs> modify the workflow uh, to add some additional things and, and do everything. They were just kind of in stun. So if you do have any questions, I don't see any over in the Q&A, um, but definitely put them in the chat for Stuart. That would be great. Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I can, I know we have some, some time here. Happy to show more, more workflows. Let me... 
Sure. Or an, I'm, uh, typically, I go long, so I'm, I'm uh, yeah, happy there's <laughs> some space here. Um, let me go yeah, find some more. More and yeses and thank yous, please. So yeah, go go right ahead. You you've got the floor, All Stuart. Right. All yours. Okay. Uh, let's go find some renewal workflows because these are interesting. Well, <laughs> While you're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and put the uh, survey for today's event in here. Mm -hmm. So just let us know how what you liked, what you didn't like, what we can improve, what we can add to it so that we can keep giving you these awesome events. And the recording will be shared out as soon as we're done. I download it, I post it, I get it out as soon as I possibly can. Sometimes it takes a little bit longer to get the captions translated, so. Cool, okay, so I'm gonna keep checking the, um, the chat for questions, but um, yeah, so the, the renewals uh, piece is really interesting because there are lots of, obviously renewals is a, uh, a challenge that a lot of businesses are trying to, uh, trying to figure out. Um, it's very, very topical, I know. Um, being proactive about driving renewals is certainly something that um, lots of teams seem to be trying to get better at, um, especially given the current uh, current climate. Um, but what's interesting is a lot of the, as I sort of dug into this, a lot of the answers in the community or in the, um, you know, the ways that you might sort of first approach it, and actually the uh, the way that I first approached it uh, actually doesn't work because there's a well, actually don't work because there's a HubSpot limitation uh, that I mentioned earlier when it comes to uh, sort of creating new deals from deals that have already been created via a workflow. Um, HubSpot's trying to, and completely understandably, trying to guard against you building infinite loops into your uh, into your systems, into your workflows, uh, because that would be bad. Um, uh, so the the way to actually automate your renewal pipeline does take a little bit of uh, extra work. Um, but this renewal pipeline and the way that you set up your renewal pipeline uh, or the renewal pipeline itself uh, honestly could be could be different depending on the things that you care about uh, during the the life cycle of a customer from sort of you know initial sale to first renewal, first renewal to uh, to second renewal, and and so on. Like in this case, I'm breaking it out uh, by by time, so six to twelve months, three to six, two to three, one month, and and renewal close one and. Uh, close last, I guess, in this case, is churned, uh, really. But um, but maybe, you know, you don't care about 6 to 12 or, or 3 to 6. Um, so you just have a, you know, 12 to or 3 to 12, something like that. And you you eliminate this stage altogether. But in any case, um, the, the breakdown here by time to renewal um, is using a renewal date, um, which is a property that we're setting... Uh, in that first workflow that uh, creates a sort of very first renewal date, uh, sorry, very first renewal uh, deal, um, we're setting a, uh, a renewal date property. Um, and then we can then uh, use a calculated property, which I should probably go, uh, go and find for you for your, all. Um, we're using a calculated property of days to renewal. Uh, this is one actually that, uh, let's see. Um, days to renewal. Um, so this uh, renewals quickly spirals into like a whole a whole bunch of different things you have to set up. Um, but this days to renewal property, the reason for creating this property um, is so that we can automate the progression of a renewal deal through that renewals pipeline as it gets closer and closer to the renewal date. So. Um, in this case, we are using this calculated property of days to renewal. Let's look at the time between today's date, which uh, unless you have uh, enterprise uh, or up, unless you have upsub, essentially, um, you'll need a another workflow to, um, well, yeah, you'll need a workflow to uh, go and create that property in any case um, and up, keep it updated. If you have upsub, it's much, much easier because you can schedule the workflow to uh, to run each day uh, and update that property. Um, otherwise, there's a workaround, which I'll also share, um, to, to go and keep that updated because, again, you run into the infinite loop uh, problem. But uh, we're just looking at the difference between today's date and the renewal date. So, you know, this is going to give us a, a 
a numeric value for the number of days uh, until the renewal, uh, which we can then use to, again, move deals through, uh, through this renewal pipeline. Um, the thing that is a little tricky um, is creating subsequent deals when you uh, close one a deal. So like this is year one uh, for Paseki. If I move it to closed one, uh, you'll see the renewal year is one. Next renewal year is even. This is another uh, calculated property. Um, the, the reason for, uh, for this is that we are using two different workflows to get around the infinite loop problem. So we're essentially bouncing back and forth uh, between the workflow that we use to create the next um, renewal deal. Um, because if I show you this, um, this is going to create um, create new deals when this renewal year type is odd. Um, and there's another workflow which is going to create subsequent deals in the renewal pipeline when this renewal year type is even. Um, so we're just bouncing back and forth uh, between the two workflows. Um, so in this case, it's if it's odd, we set the renewal year type to even um, so that the next time it runs again, it will use that other workflow, um, copy any uh, critical properties from the uh, from the deal from the renewal deal um, to the company record. This is uh, this is an optional step, um, but if you want to show sort of high level information about an account on the company, it can be really helpful. Um, and then creating the actual record itself, um, again, using this uh, sort of dynamic uh, deal name. Um, we have this next renewal year, which is another calculated property, um, which is essentially just current renewal year plus one um, so that we can dynamically use it in the, the deal name. Again, set the close date uh, and then copy uh, copy the property value, this is the important one, um, to the, the new deal that we're creating, set the renewal year, set the, again, setting the, the renewal year to the, the current value of the next renewal year. Um, so if, for example, if the, this workflow is running with a, uh, a deal where the renewal year is one, um, this uh, next renewal year, which is a calculated property, will be one plus one, so it'll be two which will mean that the new uh, renewal deal that we create for year two will have a renewal year of two. Um, again, we're copying the sales deal name. The reason for that is that uh, we're of course mutating the, uh, the name each time. So using the uh, deal that we're creating the new deal from, uh, using the name of that deal uh, wouldn't work because it will include the uh, the current year, we just want the uh, original deal name, and then we can um, add on the, the dynamic value for the next renewal year. Um, but yeah, so this one is a little complicated. Uh, I'm going to pause and make sure that that was somewhat clear, at least. <laughs> I think you have a couple of questions in the Q&A. Um, let's see, could you show how contacts are re-enrolled into the workflow? I'm not sure. Uh, yeah, so, so they actually aren't re-enrolled. I mean, re-enrollment used to be turned on for, um, for this deal, but um, the enrollment trigger really is that it's moved to, a deal is moved to closed one in this renewal pipeline. Um, and then the, the way that we choose which of the two workflows we use um, is by looking at this renewal year type, um, which will either be odd or even. In this case, this is the odd workflow. So we're checking that it's odd. The other workflow will just check that it's even, which is essentially just means that you don't enroll uh, a deal in the same workflow twice. Awesome. And then what is your must have ticket workflow? Uh, that is a good question. Uh, I would say, I mean, I'm biased here because we talk about onboarding all day long. Um, but this one, which is, uh, we call, you know, prepare to start onboarding, uh, which is sort of the part two of that, uh, 
handoff workflow that I showed earlier. So the first handoff workflow will create the ticket, but um, we, in, because that's a deal-based uh, workflow, then uh, you can't interact too much with the ticket. So we have a separate workflow, which is essentially going to take that ticket, which we just created in the ready for onboarding stage, and then uh, set it up to, to start onboarding. So in this case, we're looking at the difference between, or we're branching the, the experience depending on the type of customer, so the enterprise or SMB, we're assigning the uh, ticket to the, rotating the assignment of that ticket to the appropriate team. So enterprise in this case, or SMB in this case. Um, we are attaching uh, a customer facing arrows plan, um, which if you haven't checked out arrows um, and you're looking to, um, to do more with, with post-sale use cases, I would definitely recommend uh, doing that. Um, essentially that's going to give you a customer facing uh, experience which you can share, um, but it's connected directly sort of one-to-one -to, -one to, um, to a ticket in this case. Um, and then all the data about what's happening in that plan will come back to that ticket. So we're just creating that customer facing uh, onboarding plan to guide the customer through, uh, through that journey. Uh, we are copying the, the value, this is an arrows attribute plan URL, um, which we will need to share that uh, that plan with the customer. Um, so in this case, you can see we're taking that plan URL and we're using it to send an automated email um, to the contacts that are on that uh, that onboarding ticket um, so that they can go ahead and access their, their plan. Um, and then finally, just creating this internal prep, uh, prep task. Um, so you can see this sort of right-hand side is much more uh, self-serve, less involved. Um, and we're sending that automated email, whereas the right-hand side, we're not sending anything uh, to the customer. We're just uh, having creating everything that we need so that our team can go and prep the handoff um, and sort of handle that more more manually. But I would say that this is the this is the one that I mean we set up most often, um, and we're doing it for onboarding in this case. But you could you could do this for any moment in the in the journey. So if you're using uh, a ticket for I don't know, a QBR, for example, you could uh, use this in conjunction with your um, your renewal pipeline. You could say, okay, every time a deal moves to uh, a new stage, we're going to go create a, you know, because these are, uh, well, you would want to break this down again if you want to do quarterly uh, QBRs. But uh, anyway, you could use the the movement of a deal through this uh, pipeline to trigger creating a ticket for uh, specific, a specific uh, event in the journey, um, which can be really helpful if you have like this pipeline is being managed by, you know, maybe an account manager or by, by sales. And then you have uh, CS that wants to, to run, um, run QBRs. Um, you could go ahead and just create the, the ticket at the right moment in time to, to enable that. Which I think is one of the big benefits of uh, of doing everything in uh, or defining everything in workflows is that you get to use the data to to trigger things that um, that otherwise you would have to remember or manage an entirely separate system uh, that's sort of disconnected from from the information you have about customers. Awesome, thank you. Um, we got a what are some best practices to document the interdependency connections between Etc. between workflows and HubSpot? Yeah, that is a great question. And as you build more and more workflows, it becomes more and more important. One thing that I will say is that I find comments in workflows to be uh, really helpful to, um, you know, just to sort of notate, you know, if, if you're the person creating the, the workflow, but there's potentially somebody else who's going to be maintaining it later or needs to figure out uh, what happens. Even if you're not writing your full documentation in the comment, uh, at least link to the documentation from a comment that's sort of in line in the workflow can be um, can be really helpful. Um, I mean, at some point you have to start maintaining a knowledge base or a uh, sort of a an SOP uh, uh, document somewhere. Um, at Arrows, we use Notion pretty heavily for documentation. Um, but yeah, I I think finding ways to uh, to link it where people will already be looking uh, is helpful. Um, for example, if you, uh, in your exception tasks, uh, you know, if you have that branch in a workflow that's catching an exception, 
um, linking to the documentation from that task um, can be really helpful. Uh, how do you sort of help increase the visibility or help surface the, uh, the information that people need when they're actually trying to solve the problem? Um, is, it's helpful to make sure your documentation actually gets used. <laughs> Because um, there's nothing worse than spending a bunch of time creating documentation that nobody ever reads. Of course, <laughs> for very sure. Um, I think we might have for one more question. Let's see. Uh, what about workflows that create tasks for manual renewal creation when humans are and need to be involved? And then oh, yeah, yeah. I mean that's a that's a great uh, use case for. You could either do it based on uh, the the pipeline stages because you're breaking, you know, deals will be in a specific stage when they're a, a specific, uh, you know, a certain number of days away from that renewal, or you could just use that uh, calculated days to renewal property um, to create tasks. You could just have a workflow that says, um, you know, when days to renewal is, is 90, uh, create this task for this, for the owner of that deal, um, which again is sort of the benefit of having everything defined in data um, is you can then say, you can set your own thresholds for when this is true in the data, we go and do X. Um, uh, yeah, great call out for, for Super Trish. Um, love what they're doing over there. That's uh, gonna be really helpful, I think, for, for admins um, and helping document portals. Absolutely. All right, I do. Um, I know there's a couple more questions and we're going to be respectful of everyone's time, but if you guys want to reach out to Stuart, Stuart, do you want to share, are you LinkedIn, email, what's your favorite? method of communication for people to reach out to you with some additional questions? Yeah, LinkedIn is probably the place, uh, I mean, yeah, you can reach out via email as well, but LinkedIn is the place where I'm sharing uh, most uh, most frequently um, or uh, and shoot me a DM, connect, shoot me a DM um, if you have any specific, uh, specific questions. Uh, and make sure you head over to arrows.to slash vault. Um, if you enter your email address there, I'll get you all the um, the sort of how-to walkthroughs that we uh, we talked about. Um, and the, the big news there is probably within the next week, we'll be launching a public sort of searchable library of all the Steal This uh, series. So if you enter your email there, we'll make sure we let you know when that's available. Awesome. Thank you, Stuart. I really appreciate you coming and speaking with everyone and letting us steal your workflows and doing all the hard work for us. Um, yeah. Everyone, thank you for coming and make sure you're registering for those events. So they're showing up on your calendar and I don't have to send you 800 reminders and uh, I will see you all next week. Have thank a good you so one. Thanks so much for having me. Thanks, Art.